Hi, my name is Becky and I'm going to talk to you about some old hazardous waste dumps and hot spots located in Union County, Ohio. Some you may know about, others you may not be aware of. Please be aware I won't be discussing all the sites in Union County, so don't take this as a comprehensive list. And let me repeat that, this is not a comprehensive list of all the toxic sites in Marysville and Union County. But this list should give you a good idea of the magnitude of the problem. And to be honest, it's probably the only time you're going to get this much information about an issue I think that a lot of people in this county hope will be ignored and ultimately forgotten. I don't trust the health department. They know these sites are here. They tell us we don't have a cancer problem here, but we're the second fastest growing county population wise in Ohio. What would our cancer rates look like for those of us who have lived here long term? Are all these new residents who haven't been exposed to the long term effects of these landfills? watering down what would be a high cancer rate in our community? I don't know the answer to these questions. I do think it's a good question to ask. So I have eight toxic waste dumps and hot spots that I'm going to talk about that's within our county. Um, two are located near the intersection of Crottinger and Taylor Roads which you can get to Taylor Road off Industrial Parkway as you head toward Plain City. One of those dumps was an industrial dump used by local and outside industries. One of those dumps is supposed to be a household dump, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it because of its close proximity to the industrial waste dump. And the two are often mentioned together because of that. There's an industrial waste dump in Richwood, one off Reed Road near Raymond, one at the Marysville Estates Trailer Park off North Main Street in Marysville, and one at McCarthy Park off of Cherry Street. Additional hot spots are an unknown dump on Pine Lane, which is off County Home Road, which runs east from the Cooks Point intersection at Route 4. The Ray Lewis Company that was located off Cherry Street, and that one does tie in with the issues at McCarthy Park. And the old Marysville Wastewater Treatment Plant that's behind the Marysville Estate Trailer Park. So, so let's jump right in. We're going to start with the old Lewis Trailer Park, which is now Marysville Estates. Um, way back then, we knew it as Marysville Trailer Park or Lewis Trailer Park. Um, that's the mobile home community that's off of Route 4 as you head out of Marysville North um, there behind the shortstop. Um, actually, as you'll find out, several of our trouble zones are located within this area. Ray Lewis and Harold Lewis were the former owners of this property. You might recognize Harold Lewis's name from the Harold Lewis School, long known for working with developmentally delayed children. In 1961, the Lewises decided they wanted to install a new mobile home court there off of Route 4. This area is located in a floodplain, meaning because of its proximity to Mill Creek and the former Mill Creek Channel, it's prone to flooding. Now, while people are protesting this new trailer park, worried about their property values and the effect this park would have on them, no one stopped to consider that during this same time period, the 1960s, Portions of that mobile home park and areas surrounding it had been receiving industrial waste from places inside the county as well as outside industries. I never did find out who those outside industries were. So for about an 8 to 10 year time period, 
this property was receiving waste from Scott's. Uh, this is before Miracle Grow bought them out. General Industries, which I believe was a plastics company, and Deckrite, a plastic decorating company. And although I couldn't find documentation indicating any waste here came from Goodyear, I, I did get to see the cleanup in person, some of it, and there was a lot of rubber being took out of the ground. Now, what is troublesome is not only were there trailer park inhabitants really close to a toxic landfill that often flooded, some of the trailers were actually placed directly on top of that landfill. Um, and I want to talk about that real quick, about the flooding and stuff. When you have freshwater pipes running through the soil, um, and say the soil has got harmful contaminants in it, uh, the soil floods, it gets saturated with water. Uh, anytime you have a drop in pressure, like say everybody's washing their clothes on Sunday night before work, or maybe the fire department has opened up some fire hydrants for one reason or another, and there's a drop in water pressure, that can actually suck that contaminated water into the freshwater pipes that that's it, that the pipes are laying in and, and suck that that water right into them and then obviously distribute it throughout the the, the pipes and the plumbing systems um, so that's that's something people should be aware of some of that material in that landfill there was vermiculite you may or may not know that vermiculite was used in potting soil, fireproofing, insulation, and a bunch of other things. But in this case, the vermiculite was a waste product of Scott's that they paid Dan Adrian, a trash hauler, to dispose of for them. One of the places Adrian dumped this vermiculite sand was at the Ray Lewis dump there at the trailer court. The problem with this vermiculite is it contained asbestos, which I'm sure you are all aware of the asbestos-related disease, mesothelioma. I think it's important to note, though, that you can also be exposed to asbestos not only through the air, but also by ingestion, which can cause just as serious problems as the breathing disease. I don't think anyone really knows how much of this vermiculite waste was placed there at the trailer court, uh, but a document from the CDC states that Scott's processed approximately 430,000 tons of this particular vermiculite. Um, we do know that by 1974, Dan Adrian, and this is according to an article from the Richwood Gazette, Dan Adrian was hauling 10 to 12 tons of waste off per day from Scott's. Um, it is documented that this vermiculite waste was placed not only at the Ray Lewis dump there at the trailer park, but also at Hirschberger landfill. I'm not saying there weren't other locations where this asbestos-tainted vermiculite was placed. These are just the places I found with documentation. So maybe we have hundreds of tons or more of this vermiculite waste that was placed at the Ray Lewis landfill at the trailer park. In addition to the asbestos problem, an Ohio EPA voluntary action program found Concentrations of chlordane, heptachlor, and or heptachlor epoxide above generic direct contact standards for residential land use and or commercial slash industrial land use. And this was discovered underneath nine previously inhabited mobile home lots. My sister and her family lived in one of those mobile homes in the 1970s. I had cousins that would live there later in those very mobile home lots there that were sitting on top of that waste. 
In May of 1978, Scotts informed the EPA that they knew Dan Adrian had dumped the vermiculite sand at the Ray Lewis landfill. And in October, they write the EPA again, stating their concern that the vermiculite had not been removed per the EPA's request. Now, 1978 was also when Scotts reported to OSHA that some of their workers had lung abnormalities, which would ultimately lead to the very public and tragic realization that the mine from which that vermiculite was being mined um, did indeed contain the harmful asbestos. The name of the mining company was W.R. Grace, and in the town alone where the vermiculite was mined, it was reported that during a 20-year study period, mortality from the asbestos was 40 to 80 times greater than expected. In another 1978 letter from Scotts to Dan Adrian, Scotts is pretty upset with Adrian for dumping the vermiculite at the North Main Street location. They state the waste sand could contain trace amounts of pesticide, and this would create an obvious and immediate risk of exposure to anyone coming on the property, and in addition, a risk that this material could be washed into Mill Creek. Now, this was 1978. At that time, my sister was living on top of that waste pile with her newborn baby and husband. Do you know when the city and the Ohio EPA finally took action? 2016 is when I understand they finally made the residents of those mobile homes move. For 38 years after Scott's initially said, hey guys, we got a problem, the city and the Ohio EPA finally took action. Now, if this wasn't bad enough for the residents of that mobile home park, it gets worse. Right adjacent to the mobile home park is another toxic dump called the Marysville Landfill. In fact, EPA documents state the Ray Lewis Landfill and the Marysville Landfill kind of blurred together at one point, late 60s, early 70s, operating side by side and at some times seemingly as one dump and there was nothing to prevent residents and especially children from crawling over and around every inch of these dumps. So let's talk about some of the things you can find in the Marysville landfill. Medical waste for one. Old x-ray machines were one of the items mentioned by a worker who used to haul trash there. Old syringes and medical hose are clearly visible on the ground. The Marysville landfill also includes a former drum storage area that was filled with approximately 100 empty drums from the Ray Lewis electroplating facility. The drums were rusted through and had contained chemicals like potassium cyanide, chromium plate compound, and possible solvents. Now I say former drum storage in quotes because there are still some drums visible, at least there were last year. A 1994 field activity report done by the Ohio EPA on the Marysville landfill states, a propped up piece of plywood on an old drum show evidence of children activity near the landfill. Another 1994 report by the Ohio EPA states, children were seen fishing in the creek near the site. A 1991 telephone call between a Union County game warden and the Ohio EPA discusses evidence of growths of tumors on fish in the creek. Now the Marysville landfill was the city's dump between 1955 and 1969. 
The dump became licensed in 69, and the license was revoked in 1971 for non-compliance issues and uncontrolled dumping of demolition materials and non-sanitary solid wastes. A 1993 inspection indicated large amounts of debris, including drums and medical waste. Soil sampling indicated VOCs, SVOCs, pesticides, metals, cyanide, and soils significantly higher than background levels. Here's the problem. The line between the Marysville landfill and McCarthy Park is not well defined. In fact, a 1972 Journal Tribune article states, the Marysville Lions Club, with the blessing of the city, had taken over a project to develop the former Marysville Sanitary Landfill as a recreation area. That would become to, know, come to be known as McCarthy Park. There was no removal of contaminated soils. There was no landfill cap. But the worst part about it all, Dan Adrian was part of the committee that not only allowed it to happen, but made it happen. So mid-1990s, we start hearing about cancer clusters, and there are three children's cancer cases inside Carriage Acres subdivision, directly across the street from McCarthy Park. We know the EPA has evidence of children not only playing on the contaminated land, but actually touching materials directly used in chromium plating operations. Now for a short time, Ray Lewis attempted alternative plating procedures that did not involve hexavalent chromium, more commonly known as HEX-6 or Chrome-6, but it didn't work as effectively for them, so they resumed operations with Chrome-6. If you aren't familiar with hexavalent chromium, that's the toxin the movie Aaron Brockovich was about. While we're on the subject, the Ray Lewis and Sons plating facility is one of the hot spots I wanted to talk about. So now you know they used Chrome 6 there, which was part of their electroplating process. They also performed, performed die casting and machining. For instance, zinc plumbing fixtures were cast and plated with different metal finishes. A preliminary assessment report states, Waste streams at the facility included chromium, copper, nickel, zinc, and cyanide. They were considered a large quantity waste generator by the EPA for 30 years. For several years during the late 60s and early 70s, the facility used an on-site lagoon system to treat their wastewater. This wastewater was discharged to Ray Lewis Ditch. Where is Ray Lewis Ditch? It's near the children's playground equipment in McCarthy Park, near the right, the right side. If you are looking at the park standing on the sidewalk at Cherry Street, it, it would be on the right side where the children's playground equipment is, kind of down the hill there. Ray Lewis Ditch is still there today an innocuous trickle of water providing a perfect place for kids to splash around in. To my knowledge, there's never been any effort to restrict access to this waste outfall. Just last year, I saw kids digging in the soil adjacent to this ditch. Nineteen ninety five and nineteen ninety eight and the Ohio EPA reports indicate impacts from cyanide and metals to surface water and sediment in the ditch and immediately downstream in Mill Creek. At one point, the final discharge of wastewater from Ray Lewis and Sons reached 45,000 gallons a day. The lagoons that received the cyanide and chromium wastewater were unlined. These lagoons ultimately discharged into another deeper final lagoon that too was unlined. Even after the lagoon system was discontinued and covered over, 
the concentration of cyanide and metals in Ray Lewis ditch were still in violation of their discharge permit. And this was 20 years after the lagoons were no longer used. So the residents of Marysville Trailer Court and Carriage Acres were quite close to some pretty nasty stuff. Don't you think if parents had been informed about the landfills and Ray Lewis ditch, they would have kept their kids from playing there? But instead of protecting these residents, the city made it into a park and invited kids to crawl all over it. I don't think there's anyone out there who can justify that. It's really unconscionable. I can't even tell you that that's the last of the hot spots in that few square mile area. It isn't. Directly behind the trailer park and built on a portion of the Marysville landfill is the old wastewater treatment plant. I consider this another hot spot because of the practices employed here and the fact they began receiving industrial wastewater sometime during the 1970s. In spring of 1992, the Ohio EPA noted a large area outside of the wastewater treatment plant appears to have been used for disposal of a sludge-like material. Some of this disposal has taken place within the boundaries of the former landfill. Observed were backhoe trenches filled with sludge, a large circular pit about 50 feet in diameter filled with sludge, and sludge was also dumped on open ground. Now let me back up here a minute. There were actually two treatment plants here what was considered the old sewage treatment plant, and then in 1979, they built a new wastewater plant. Both plants received industrial wastewater. In 1978, the Marysville sewage treatment plant was put on the surplus list, which my understanding, it's like where they find out if it should be eligible for being a Superfund site. Um, because it had a high medium groundwater contamination score. The major concern of the time was the metals content of the sludge due to the industries in Marysville discharging to the sewer plant. The EPA preliminary assessment source summary of 1985 indicates cyanide, copper, chromium, nickel, and other unnamed waste types. Sometime after 1979, it appears the city approved the sludge for use in agricultural land use, meaning they got rid of it by letting the farmers spread it on their fields. I believe the document said there were three farms that were utilizing this sludge material, and no, I don't know what farms they were. Also, when they built the wastewater plant in 1979, it was partially built on a portion of the Marysville landfill. So basically, the residents living within this few square mile area have really had it handed to them as far as the potential for exposure to harmful contaminants, and especially their kids since they're the ones most likely to go out exploring and getting into this stuff. In 2016, there are emails between an EPA Superfund coordinator, and this is on the national level, and the Ohio EPA discussing the former drum storage area that we just talked about, where the coordinator, who's from the Region 5 Superfund office in Chicago states, Assuming you, the Ohio EPA, do not want to proceed any further with the site assessment process, I think we can reasonably make the case to my management that we can end frap the site, even though it scores over 28.5. Now, end frap means no further remedial action planned. The report also suggests that the local hydrology, hydrogeology, may make it unlikely that the site is impacting local groundwater. 
What? Unlikely that the site is impacting local groundwater and it's in a floodplain? And let me tell you something about the data they used to make the decision not to end frap this site or the Marysville landfill, for that matter. Every year, there's an annual groundwater sampling event at the Marysville landfill. And the Ohio EPA, every year, would tell the companies doing the testing and the city, three of the four monitoring wells providing our data are not down gradient of the site. So we're probably not getting an accurate picture of the groundwater quality. Well, at one point, the city of Marysville wrote back and said, so are you recommending us to place additional monitoring wells or are you telling us to place additional monitoring wells across the former Mill Creek Channel? And the EPA responded, oh, we're just recommending. This was going on from at least 2006 to 2017. Every year, the Ohio EPA would say, oh, by the way, three of those four wells aren't down gradient of the site, probably not getting an accurate, accurate picture of our water quality. So this data of these, these groundwater monitoring reports, this is the data that they used to proclaim these sites as no further remedial action planned based on the lack of migration of contaminants. Data obtained from wells they knew were in the wrong place to start with. Okay, let's move on. The dumps at Crottinger and Taylor, I won't say too much about. This is one you can find information on on the web. So the dump off Taylor would have been the Unico landfill and across the tracks and accessible by Crottinger would have been the Hirschberger landfill. The Hirschberger landfill was said to have operated between 1970 and 1975 or 1976 and accepted municipal and industrial waste. Companies whose waste could be found here were the American National Can Company, Monsanto, which don't automatically think Roundup. I'm fairly certain they had something to do with the can company. Um, Scott's, PPG, and Goodyear. A 1998 DFFO, which is the director's final findings and order from the EPA, states, the remedial investigation slash feasibility study revealed that uncontrolled leachate has been released and continues to be released from this landfill. This leachate contains industrial waste and or other wastes and or hazardous wastes and or hazardous substances. The leachate poses an imminent and substantial danger to the public health and the environment the leachate must be controlled. Now, I'm not sure about it now. Maybe they have city water out there. At any rate, in 1991, there were 260 homes within a three mile radius that relied on wells for drinking. Now, here's a scary thing. EPA document states that the Unico landfill, which is right next door to the Hirschberger landfill, is zero feet above the aquifer. That means here's the aquifer where the groundwater is located, and here's the landfill. There's no degree of separation between them. Now, wouldn't it be logical to assume if the Unico landfill is butting against the aquifer, the Hirschberger landfill? right next door would be too. That might be something the residents out there would want to inquire about, especially if there's anyone out there still using wells. A 1995 Tribune article states, 
Tests of the landfill by the EPA have found that it contains high levels of dangerous substances such as arsenic. However, test wells, wells drilled by the EPA two years ago found no contamination of the water supply. Bob Carl of the Darby Creek Association stated the landfill was one of the most disturbing sites he had ever seen. There are a lot of carcasses and skeletons in the area. EPA documents about the Hirschberger landfill state vinyl chloride was a main contaminant of concern. A 1997 decision document by the EPA states 2-butanone, 4-methyl-2-pentanone, ethylbenzene, nitrobenzene, and 4-methylphenol contributes to the leachate exceeding the Ohio EPA's human health risk criteria for non-carcinogenic risks. Preventing direct contact with the leachate is necessary to reduce the risk to acceptable levels. And that's from that 1997 decision document. From looking over these online documents about Hirschberger Landfill, I'm making an educated guess. An underground storage tank was put in sometime between 97 and 98 to collect the leachate draining from that landfill. So for the year 2018 alone, they collected 2.6 million gallons of leachate and disposed of it off-site. Since 1998, the total cumulative amount of leachate hauled off from Hirschberger landfill was 29 and a half million gallons, gallons. Now at least they're doing something, but something I think people need to understand is no solution is perfect. For instance, also in 2018, they discovered a crushed section of collection tile that had to be replaced. <clears throat> so now let's talk about Unico landfill, adjacent to the Hirschberger landfill, for just a minute. It was supposed to be only municip municipal waste, which I'm assuming is household trash, although back when the dump operated, apparently from 76 to 81, the definition of what was hazardous to dump with city trash then is obviously different now, but it is supposed to be the more benign of the two dumps. However, a 2017 EPA long-term monitoring plan for the site states it contains municipal solid wastes and hazardous wastes. There are documented leachate outbreaks the EPA states the landfill cap is not being maintained, and visibly, you can see something is stressing the vegetation on top. Here is the 2017 plan for that landfill. Drive by once a year in what they call a drive-by windshield survey. Perform an on-site inspection every three years, where they will actually get out of their car and walk around the site. They will test the groundwater every three years. Now, at the end of 2017, the EPA notifies some people that they have had trichloroethylene problems apparently due to the Unico landfill. It's in that EPA file that the EPA has lowered the acceptable indoor air quality standard for exposure to TCE. Because these people's properties were already documented to have releases of VOCs, particular, particularly TCE, the EPA was notifying them that they needed to check their properties again. And that's about all you can find for the Unico landfill, at least on the EPA website. Okay, let's talk about Richwood landfill next. This landfill is located off Landon. I don't have the EPA documents on this site. And really, I encourage anyone who's interested to do a FOIA request to the Ohio EPA and get these records pulled before they decide they can use some rule 
where they can destroy them if they get so old. In fact, um, one of the files I had obtained on the Ray Lewis landfill actually had scribbled on it, can't we get rid of this since it's so old? Um, this is valuable information that is really at risk of being lost if people like me and you don't take the time to go get it. That being said, I'm really busy, so if anyone is interested, now's the time to go pull those documents. So getting back to the Richwood dump, it operated from the late 1960s to 1979. Uh, Hirschberger of Hirschberger Landfill also ran this dump. Then it was transferred over to Dan Adrian. This was a landfill rife with problems for the residents of Richwood. The landfill was located right next to the city's drinking wells, and the village went through hell to get those wells moved. Lawsuits were filed against the operators of the landfill and even the Union County Health Department over conditions at the landfill. A 1974 Marion Star newspaper article quotes the EPA as saying, the landfill should never have been placed in the same area as the wells, and the local Board of Health should have inspected the situation. Another 1974 article states, Richwood officials and a geologist toured the dump saying the condition displays misuse and dumping chemical substances, various other objectionable waste products, creating such conditions that could be termed detrimental to health and deplorable. The water wells pulled water from approximately 500 feet under the dump. Any contaminating substance leaking through the clay base would go right into the water pumped from the well. I don't think in the end Richwood got any help funding their new water well project. 11 years after first realizing there is a problem, the residents were still fighting for clean water. A 1985 Richwood Gazette article states, the main concern is the buildup of nitrates in the well field and a health advisory warning against the use of drinking water for infants under six months of age. And the buildup has been linked to an abandoned landfill 150 feet away from the village well field. Ammonia was also a contaminant of concern and probably provided a breeding ground for the nitrites. The article goes on to state, what is in the landfill remains a mystery as a court battle to obtain the closure of the landfill has been waged for the past seven years. I found a 1991 article where the EPA named three sites as high priority. Cottinger Road's Hirschberger Landfill, Elgers, and Richwood. This article states there is evidence hazardous waste has been handled or disposed of at the sites and that there is also evidence of a release of this hazardous waste which may present a substantial threat to public health or safety. We know Elgers and the Hirschberger landfill have been or are being addressed. I just don't know what happened with the Richwood landfill site. There are a few recent documents on the EPA's document portal, but they are just visual inspections and a couple rounds of gas monitoring, which one sample did turn up methane gas at a 34% level. What happened between 1991 and today, I reckon a FOIA request will have to be made. One of the last newspaper articles I can find from the fall of 1991 is from the Richwood Gazette, and they report that previous testing at the site revealed the presence of several contaminants in the soil and groundwater such as ketones, phenols, and heavy metals. Now, as mysterious as the Richwood landfill is, the one on Reed Road near Raymond is even more mysterious. 
I was able to pull what little EPA documents were available for that site, and here's what I know. It operated from approximately 1965 to 1970. In 1969, the Ohio Department of Health started receiving complaints about the dump saying trash wasn't being buried and industrial wastes from Scott's, Goodyear, and other industries in Marysville were being dumped at the landfill. One letter was sent to the health department in 1970 saying, industrial chemicals, wastes, bags which contained chemicals, etc., were dumped and left for days on end. Blowing debris could be found all around the site as well as in neighboring farms. This letter also mentioned a chemical spill late in the fall of 1969. Even after the landfill's permit was revoked, a letter to the Union County Board of Health in 1973 states, Dan Adrian dug a hole 14 feet wide and 25 feet deep and dumped two loads of solid waste material, which he then covered up that evening. The same EPA document states heavy rain causes a runoff from the property and it's my understanding after talking to the soil conservation people that that runoff heads straight for Mill Creek and that's one of the points I wanted to make right now when you have problem landfills scattered all along Mill Creek from top to bottom in Union County you have to get all the sites, not just one. I mean, it's like Mill Creek is doomed no matter what. There's always talk about the health of Mill Creek, but when have you ever heard, hey, let's address that old chemical dump up by Raymond that's running off into the creek. And to be honest, if people don't start getting upset and angry about the things I'm telling you, they probably never will. So back to Raymond. One of the many complaints about this landfill included this one. It is inconceivable to those of us in this area that those who are supposed to be knowledgeable in the laws pertaining to health and sanitation would grant a license in the first place for a public dump to be put in just across the road from a large and long established dairy farm. Mr. Anderson has about 250 dairy and young cattle that graze the field immediately opposite this landfill. Since several industries use this landfill, on occasions quantities of chemicals are dumped here and have laid for days uncovered. Surface water, drains from this landfill, along the county road, under the highway, and into the pasture where a small stream is formed in wet weather. <clears throat> Mr. Anderson's cattle drink from that stream. To the back of the landfill, the water drains over the farm of Mr. Ritchie. In addition, trucks hauling waste material to the dump have scattered debris and chemicals in the area where small children travel and the public must travel. One incident being when a truck rounded the corner and dumped a large quantity of chemicals into the roadside ditch. I mean, these neighbors are hot in this letter, and rightfully so. But in the end, there was never an inch of this contaminated soil removed, or if there was, it's not in the EPA documents that I've got. The only monitoring being done is explosive gas monitoring. To my knowledge, and I could be wrong, but I don't even think there's a landfill cap there. I can't find any soil or groundwater tests, despite the landfill being documented as receiving chemical waste. So that leaves me with the last landfill on my list, Pine Lane. The EPA tells me they can't find any information on this landfill. It is listed on one EPA document online, 
It's just one line and a line of hundreds in an Excel document titled Old Solid Waste Landfills. And you can find that by searching the internet simply by literally, literally typing in O-L-D-S-F, no, O-L-D-S-W-L-F. It's under Dover Township and was the township dump. Because there are apparently no other documents on this dump, I'm only able to tell you what I've gleaned from residents in a construction company who wanted to build there. So as I mentioned, it was the township dump, and apparently a lot of appliances were dumped there as well. Now, in that Ohio EPA document I mentioned, Typically, it tells you what kind of landfill each site was. For instance, the Richwood landfill is listed as receiving 70% household trash, 30% industrial. But for the Pine Lane Dover Township dump, it just says unknown. However, back in the late 80s, a construction company went to talk to the health department about building there. You know, you have to get approval for permits and septic and things like that. And the health department told them, no, you can't build there, that's a dump. The man from the construction company said the health department told them fertilizer byproduct had been buried there. Now, you also have to consider the kind of materials they used in appliances back then, freon, lead, PCBs, even mercury. And you realize this unknown dump could be a witch's cauldron of trouble. And that's really all I know on the Pine Lane Dover Township dump. Before I close, I wanted to go back and say a few things about the Ray Lewis landfill at Marysville Estates. They've remediated the property, and I'm going to tell you how they did it. They scraped off two feet of topsoil and took it to the back of the site and buried it in a hole. Keep in mind, parts of this landfill were 12 feet deep. So they took off the two top feet and put new soil on top. They covered up the hole they dug near the back of the site and covered it with a clay mixture that ended up being about 15% clay is what I'm told. Here's the disconcerting part for me. Nowhere did they use a synthetic cap to keep rain and possibly flood water out, since we are talking about a floodplain here, from seeping down through the newly laid dirt and down into the contaminated soil, potentially allowing for the migration of contaminants through groundwater. So this isn't a comprehensive list of where all the toxic waste is in Union County, but it's a good start. Thank you for listening. I hope someone finds this information valuable.